Welcome to Nerd Night. Yeah, you, you can clap. It's all right. <laughs> this is, uh, you know, we like to cultivate a uh, a sense of, you know, looseness and fun. So feel free to clap at any point and cheer and whistle and all that. So this is uh, this is Nerd Night. Thank thank you all for coming. We're gonna have a great night for you tonight. So I'm gonna just give you a really brief kind of intro to Nerd Night. Some of you have heard this before, but uh, I'll, do it at, I'll do it at all the Nerd Nights for the new folks. By the way, how many people were are here for the first their first Nerd Night tonight? Whoa, that is fantastic. Uh, I'm Mo Lopin. I'm the host of the Nerd Night in Northampton. Uh, basically, I got started, I got involved with Nerd Night in Boston. I was kind of loosely involved. I just was big, mostly a big fan about it, a big Nerd Night nerd, if you will. And um, moved out here in April and was just really excited about bringing Nerd Night to Northampton because I thought it would be like really popular. I thought people would really dig it out here. And I also missed it and kind of wanted to go. So that was my way of having a place to go to see Nerd Night. They get faster as they go to Violet, and those are the faster wavelengths. But then Magenta is this one that it kind of combines the two ends of the spectrum together, and we can see it. But according to physics, it doesn't actually exist. You have to go into neuroscience to get to that one, and it's still a pretty big mystery. We don't really know what's going on with that. So um, that ends up being a big metaphor for just about everything that we don't understand yet because it kind of ends up being a paradox where you have the big end, the small end, and then the big and the small at the same time. And it ends up being two opposites are both true at the same time. And we think of that as being a paradox, but actually yeah, it's just magenta. So, um, and in case you're wondering off the bat too, fuchsia and magenta is the same color. Uh, this, end, this end of the spectrum ends up getting a lot of weird names because you start to get like where indigo would be. And indigo is like, if you can't tell if it's blue or purple, it's probably indigo because it's right between the two. Uh, and what's really great too about the color wheel is that in other countries, I know Russia, for example, is one of them. They do actually call this a different color than blue because it's cyan. And this is blue, that's cyan. And we tend to call it like sky blue or light blue, but it's a different color. So that brings us into um, lesson number one, where your art teacher might have lied to you a little. Yeah, tonight was amazing. We had two great talks. Uh, our first talk was Aaron Jensen, who told us about color, the color wheel. Um, he had lasers and a black light, and he explained how the uh, magenta is this strange phenomenon that is more perceived by our eye than scientifically, and that it sort of connects these two disparate ends of the color spectrum. If you were to think of the electromagnetic spectrum as a circle, then gamma waves would be right in the middle, kind of like pinpointed, and then as they go out, visible light is on the middle here, and infrared uh, microwaves radio goes out to the outside there. So when we are seeing, again, because I was thinking like, okay, there's no neon colors in the rainbow, there's no fluor fluorescent pink, what makes pink fluorescent, or what makes uh, black lights work? And I brought a black light. And rather than bringing something neon, I brought something, I think, a little cooler. I got a glow-in-the-dark frisbee. <laughs> so you notice that the ne a black light will like supercharge something that glows in the dark. It supercharges it. And he also talked about values and the two ways colors can be mixed, additive and subtractive color. And uh, it was really amazing and interesting. And then our second talk was, uh, was Al Crosby and Duncan Urshik, who are at UMass. And um, Al is a polymer scientist, and Duncan is a biologist, and they've worked with geckos to discover how they are able to walk on walls. And they have just demonstrated amazingly how they converted that information into a synthetic material that mimics the, the way uh, geckos can adhere to surfaces, but even better than geckos can do it. So they're able to hold massive amounts of weight with uh, sort of fabric adhesive that can be reused over and over and over and is really inexpensive to make. Well, so you could think about taking um, a 42 inch panel flat screen um, television and here's Mike, there's Dan, John I didn't introduce, he works on a different project, still cool, um, and they're going to hold up um, this 42 inch panel of TV on a piece of glass with a piece of gex skin and you can see he's just going to apply it by hand and then they're going to let it go. This was my TV, and we, <laughs> we were not very smart when we got started. You can see we don't have a crash pad at all. We don't have any safety chains. Um, and that 
we were confident, I guess, or you could use other words. <laughs> uh, so anyway, they sit down, they do some really bad PhD acting, um, and, and they go through, uh, and they'll pull it off somewhere around here. So just with a twist of the hand, you'll peel it off, and it comes right back on. And what's cool about that is that you can do this on and off again, on and off again, wherever you want. Okay, so we're going to tell you how that works. So in order to tell you about how it works, Duncan's going to take over and tell you something about geckos. So I'm Duncan Urshik, I'm a professor of biology at UMass Amherst, and I've been studying gecko adhesion for many years, as well as, as, well as many other things. And um, I started working at gecko adhesion back in the 90s, and actually, um, you guys are probably all aware of what geckos can do, right? And this is actually a gecko I brought from my lab. I have about seven different species in my lab. Uh, if any of you want to visit, you're welcome to contact me. I have some of the rarest species in the world. Um, this is Big Mama. She's, uh, why do we call her Big Mama? Because she's big and she once laid some eggs. We ascertained she was female. <laughs> it's kind of that simple. But Thank you guys so much, Alan Duncan. Amazing talk all around. The whole night was, was fantastic. Thanks a lot for coming to Nerd Night.